I just wish I could see that clock better. But in all seriousness, well, maybe this might not sound too serious, but uh, it is in a way. Um, saw the story about this congregation, this preacher. He came to a new congregation, and uh, he came there. And he thought he wanted to familiarize himself with the members, the teachers, the children, the Bible classes, and so forth. And so he thought he would go around one Sunday morning and make the rounds and visit Bible classes. So he came to one class and he asked the children, he said, who can tell me who tore the walls of Jericho down? And little Johnny over in the corner, not Johnny Hoxstein, but <laughs> he said, I didn't do it. Preacher turned around at the teacher, and she said, well, Johnny is an honest boy, and if he said he didn't do it, I believe him. <laughs> so by this time, he went to the elders and talked to them about the matter. They said, well, preacher, just find out how much it costs to fix it, and we'll foot the bill. <laughs> but you know, friends, that's, that sounds humorous, but you know, there are some congregations that are about like that when it comes to knowledge of God's Word. They are like the Sadducees to whom Jesus spoke, you therefore err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. And as Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea four six. But I love and appreciate the Lord's church here at Bellevue Bellevue and the elders here and the preacher and the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ here at the Bellevue Church of Christ. So thankful to be here. It's an honor for my family and our good friends. Brother and Sister Burke's got to come with us. We thank the Lord for all of that, these many blessings from the Lord. Friends, as we look tonight at the doctrine of Hades, heaven, and hell, I look out upon the audience. I see probably most, if not all, of everyone here is a faithful member of the Lord's church. Of course, I don't know everyone's condition. God does. But then on the internet, we don't know who all may be listening. But I do hope tonight that this lesson will not only be a refutation of realized eschatology, but will also be an encouragement to all of us. I have a thought here. The doctrine of realized eschatology has been refuted in this lectureship. And realized eschatology is not real. Whether the realized eschatologists realize it or not, that's the reality of the matter. It has been refuted very soundly. As we think about the Bible doctrine of Hades, heaven and hell, we go back to the Old Testament, we find a word Translated several times in the American Standard Version, a sheol. It means the same as the word Hades in the New Testament. Of course, we find the Greek word Hades, translated Hades in the American Standard Version 11 times, but translated hell in the King James Version. And sometimes we think, well, the King James translators just missed that. But remember, in the days of the King James translation, to hell one's potatoes meant to cover them up. They would be unseen. That was a way of speaking back then. So the word hell did not always mean in every case the final abode of the wicked. It did mean in some sense the unseen in the days of the King James translation. But we find that when it comes to Sheol or Hades, this is the realm of the unseen, the abode of departed spirits. There are two aspects of the Hadean realm, the unseen realm. There is paradise where the poor beggar Lazarus went in Luke 16, 25, where he was comforted. And there is Tartarus, or Tartarosis, as the Greek word is in 2 Peter 2, 4, or the place of torments, Luke 16, 23, where the rich man went. And there's a great gulf fixed between the two, 
according to Luke 16, verse 26. So everyone that passes away goes into the Hayden realm. The righteous to paradise where Jesus and the penitent thief went, as he said to him in Luke 23, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Or to the place of torments where the rich man went and where the angels at sin went. According to 2 Peter 2, verse number 4, to await the judgment day. We note over in the book of Revelation, and I'd like to turn over there at this time to Revelation chapter 20. Now this verse will destroy, realize eschatology. And of course, Brother Doug dealt well with that out of Revelation and out of various passages. But this one, in Revelation 20, it does relate to our subject. Verse number 12. John said, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which are written in the books according to their works. Now certainly the judgment according to our e-doctrine is not universal. But this depicts a universal judgment. But there's more to it even than that. As we go on down in verses 13 and 14. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, even the lake of fire. And so when the end comes, death and Hades will be done away and cast into the lake of fire. So death and Hades will be done away. And as Brother Denham did so well the other day in showing how the death is not a possibility after the resurrection. It cannot be over there in Luke chapter 20. Neither can they die anymore. There is no death. And isn't that a great and wonderful thing if we're right with the Lord? Now as we think tonight about Hades, heaven and hell, Let's look at the word Sheol for a moment. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 22, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and burneth unto the lowest Sheol, and devoureth the earth with its increase, and setteth on fire the foundations of the mountains. It is my understanding, and the King James renders this the lowest hell, and it's called that in Psalm 86, 13, that this refers to the torment aspect of Sheol or Hades, just as Tartarus refers to it in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. We know, moreover, regarding Sheol, that it was said of Abraham when he died over in the book of Genesis, in the 25th chapter, verse number 8, that Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. That's a common expression for those that go into Sheol or the Hadean realm in the Old Testament. That this individual was gathered to his people. Brother Alexander Campbell in the Living Oracles, his translation of the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2 verse 31 renders it thusly, He, foreseeing this, that is David, spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that his soul should not be left in the unseen world, nor his flesh see corruption. So the Hadean realm is indeed the unseen world, the realm of the unseen. Now let's think about the rich man and Lazarus for a moment. Let's go over to the book of Luke in the 16th chapter. Beginning at verse 23. And in Hades, the, he, that is the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. 
for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, there's going to be a memory in eternity. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now but here but now here he is comforted, and thou art in anguish, and besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, that they that would pass from hence to you may not be able, and that none may cross over from thence to us. Now both the rich man and the beggar Lazarus went into Hades, into the Hadean realm. But yet there are two aspects of the Hadean realm. Paradise, where Lazarus the beggar went. A place of comfort, peace, and rest to await the judgment. And the place of torment, where the rich man was in anguish in the flames. And the rich man became a beggar. He begged for Abraham to send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in water. And he said, Cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so there are two different aspects of the Hadean realm. Friends, tonight I just I want to mention a few names. And I know these are not the only godly people that have entered into eternity in the last two years or so. But in 2012, my godly mother, I have confidence, went into paradise. The following January, Sister Levon McClish, beloved sister in Christ, we have confidence also went there. And that same year, Brother Kozad, Brother Tim's father, who one time was an elder here and was indeed a faithful brother, he went into eternity. And Brother Fred Stankliff, he was a great man. He was an elder here the last time that I was here on the lectureship. But he's now gone into eternity. And then one brother I know that we all miss also is Brother Ken Chumley earlier this year. Friends, this is the hope that we have in Christ, and we should not give this up for anything. Amen. Not only hope for ourselves, but we saw or not as others who have no hope. As we consider these and many others that could have been mentioned, faithful saints who have departed from us. And of them all, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Now I want to go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 at this time regarding the angels that sin. This is on the other side. These didn't go into paradise. These went to a place of torment. They're still there too. For if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, the word translated hell here is from Tartarosis. And it's translated hell in both the American Standard Version and the King James. And this is the only time this word appears in the New Testament. The only time. But these words indicate that one day they're not going to be in this place anymore. They're reserved in this place until the judgment. So you see the AD 70 people have that wrong. The judgment is coming. And then in a parallel statement in the book of Jude in the 6th verse, Jude says the following, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Unto that time. But when the end comes, death and Hades, as we read from Revelation 20, verse 14, will be cast into the lake of fire. Death and Hades will end at that point and will be no more. There will be no more death and there will be no more Hades after that point. We know that in Acts 2, verse 27, 31, and brethren today, and I believe at other times in the lectureship, 
They've used this to refer to the psalmist who said concerning God that he would not leave the Lord's soul in hell. Of course, properly there, it's Hades. The Lord did not go to the eternal abode of the wicked to gain a hell. He went into the Hadean realm, into paradise, and was raised on the third day before his body could undergo decomposition. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption, as Paul preached to those in Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13, verse 37. But you remember when Lazarus died, that one of the sisters said that he's been dead now four days. He stinketh. So evidently it was common knowledge that after three days, there was at least the possibility of the direction of that body beginning to decompose. But the Lord's body did not remain in the tomb long enough for that to happen. But also, paradise is not heaven. Although Jesus went into the Hadean realm, into paradise for three days, he did not go to heaven. After his resurrection, he said to Mary, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. John 20 and verse number 17. But yet he would go to the Father. And we remember Acts chapter 1, 9 through 11, how the apostles were observing as he went up into heaven, and the angel said that he shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Indeed, Jesus returned to the Father's right hand. And for us tonight, when I think about this false doctrine and those caught up in it, there is a verse that they are not observing. And that's Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, along with many others. Paul said there, If ye then be risen with Christ, or since you are risen with Christ, and they had been because... They've been buried with Christ in baptism and raised with Him, according to Colossians 2.12, raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6.4, as we are today if we are Christians. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The problem with many of these false doctrines, not only the RE doctrine, but others, such as premillennialism, is they are too earthly minded. They do not have their affections on things above. They do not have their affections on the Word of God. Psalm 119, 89, Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. If we will put our heart and affections on things above, we're not going to be caught up in some fanciful doctrine that is based on the things of this world and this earth and earthly events. But now, in Matthew 16... Verse number 18 is another proof that the Lord's church is greater than the temple in Jerusalem. After Peter made the good confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said to him, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Of course, we know the word there is Hades. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Death and the Romans prevailed against Jerusalem and the temple. God had already foreordained to remove that system. But the Romans could not destroy the church of Christ. The Muslims could not destroy the church of Christ. No man, not even Satan himself, can destroy the church of Christ. The church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28. Now, my friends, let's think about heaven. There was a song that came on the radio several years ago, Heaven is a Place on Earth. And I'm not going to begin to imagine or explain what that was talking about. But I have an idea it wasn't good. But heaven is not on this earth, and it's not a place on this earth. And we can prove that by the Bible. As we turn back to the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter, John said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The first earth was passed away, and this is figurative language here. 
And we know later here that the Lord said, Behold, I make all things new. In verse number 5. And 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12, that's been dealt with so, uh, so much in this lectureship, and rightly so. All the, the earth and all the elements will be burned up and destroyed when the day of the Lord comes. When I was preaching in Virginia, two ladies from the Watchtower Society, so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, came to the door one day. And uh, I said, let's turn to 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. And I asked one of them to read it, and she did. And I said, now, now what, what, what does that say? What does that mean? She said, I don't know, but it doesn't mean what it says. <laughs> That's kind of like not reading the text, isn't it? <laughs> At least she was, uh, I guess, honest on how she really felt about it, but she was wrong. And she was going down the sidewalk. Leaving the property, she threw her hand up in there. She said, I'm not going to heaven. I said, I know you're not if you don't repent and get out of the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> but it's just a fact. Might as well tell the truth about it. We know that this earth, my friends, is full of sin and filth and degradation and cruelty and hatred and meanness and immorality and all kinds of things. Revelation 21 27 proves that heaven is not this earth. And there shall in no wise enter into the anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work of the abomination or make of the lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven is a reflection of the character of God. God is too high and holy and pure to look upon sin, according to back at 1.13. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If a man say that he has fellowship with God and walks in darkness, he lies and does not the truth, according to 1 John 1, verse 5 and 6. Now, the word tabernacle in Revelation 21, 3 indicates intimate fellowship with God. This is the case if you go back to the Old Testament. Of course, their closeness to God was not and will not be like heaven. But yet the tabernacle and the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, that represented the presence of God among the children of Israel. And so the tabernacle of God here, referring to heaven, when men get to heaven, the tabernacle of God among men indicates intimate, close, and eternal fellowship with God Almighty. That's why we want to go there, isn't it? Paul said, My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 1, 23. But in Revelation 21, 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's what heaven is all about. It's only for those who love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12, Mark 12, 30. And who love the Lord and keep His commandments. John 14 and verse number 15. Many times when we talk about heaven, we talk about how beautiful it is or will be. And no doubt it will be. We cannot possibly fathom or imagine the glory and beauty of heaven. It reminds me of a story about a little girl one time that was born blind. And the doctor said, well, maybe after a few years we can do surgery so she can gain her sight. So those early years rolled on. The mother tried her best to explain the beauty of God's creation. Until finally one day they said, we, let's do surgery. So they did. They bandaged up her eyes, and after a few days they removed the bandages. She, she could see light. And she went over to the window and looked out. She said, Mother, why didn't you tell me how beautiful it really is? The little girl could only have it explained to her in a certain way. She could not really fully imagine it. And so in Revelation 21, God uses figurative language, what we call sometimes accommodative language. Things that we can relate to, like pearl and jasper and gold and all manner of beautiful stones to give us an idea of the beauty of heaven, but we cannot fully comprehend. We cannot even begin to comprehend 
how glorious and beautiful heaven will be. Revelation 21, beginning at verse 18. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth the topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, as it were transparent glass. And, verse 20 and 20, 23. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, in our present earthly mortal state, we cannot approach unto such a light as that. Christ dwelleth in a light which no man can approach unto, according to 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. But for those who purify themselves as he is pure, according to 1 John 3, 3, one day we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, 1 John 3, 2. When we reach that state and have a glorified body like unto his, Philippians 3, 21, then we will be able to be in the presence of that light and that glory. You remember when the Lord met Saul on the road to Damascus? As Paul recounted that in Acts 26, 13, it was at midday when the sun's rays were the most direct, but he said it was a light above the brightness of the sun. What a great light. We cannot possibly even comprehend or imagine the glory and the beauty and the light of heaven. Before we get into this next part, though, I'd like to relate a story that was told about a mother who was dying and her little boy was by her bedside holding her hand. And he said, Mother, if I hold your hand, can I go to heaven with you? You know, friends, we ought to be such an example that our children and those around us can follow us to heaven. We should be that kind of example. John said, And I saw, uh, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. In Revelation 21, 4, think about the things that will not be in heaven. No pain, no tears, no death, no sorrow, no sin. That will be worth it all right there, won't it? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The former things are passed away. The AD 70 people are not going to take that away from us, nor the fact that we're going to be in the presence of the Lord for eternity. If by the grace of God and with His help we remain faithful, we hope and pray that we will. Now for the last part, let's turn over to the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, and beginning at verse 43. You know, Jesus tells us this is why we should fear God. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, verse 28. You know, friends, uh, there are many things in our country today going awry. If you could ask me one thing that I would say is attributes to this big mess we're in. Paul stated in Romans 3, there is no fear of God before their eyes. I believe, friends, that is the root to it all. Inasmuch as also it is the duty, the whole of man, to fear God and keep his commandments. In Mark chapter 9 here, beginning at verse number 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, 
and to the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now this is talking about not Hades, but Gehenna hell of fire, the lake of fire, as John said as he concluded Revelation 20. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a second death, Revelation 21, verse 8. We all have to die the first death because it was appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. But we don't have to go through the second death, thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to undergo the second death. One time I, ple I preached in a place, and uh, there was a lady there. She was a member of the church, and her husband came with her. He was not a member. And I, I would go to see him, talk to him. I went to see him one day, and he offered to tell me this. I didn't ask him, but he said, you know why I only have one arm? He said, one day I was out in the field baling hay, and I had my arm up in the hay baler trying to, you know, loosen it up or get it to run. All of a sudden it came on and tore my arm off. That had to be a lot of pain, didn't it? But you know, there's something a lot more painful than that, and that is to lose one's soul in a hell of fire, the lake of fire brimstone. Why would the Lord use such teaching as this? You know, some brethren say, well, that's too hard. That's too, it's too harsh. Well, the same reason we warn our children about danger and even spank them if they don't obey us is because we love them. Jesus Christ warned many times about hell. He paid the ultimate price that we not go there, but he also took the time and put forth the effort during his earthly ministry to warn time and time and time again of the horrors of hell. There's a reason he did that. But now let's go a little further. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter a halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now there's your feet right there. You know, sometimes people say, oh, my feet just carry me places I know I shouldn't go. It might carry me on the dance floor. You know, I've heard the saying that a dancing foot and a praying knee are never on the same leg. There's a lot of truth to that. You know, dancing, lasciviousness, carrying people down to places where they're mixed swimming and immodest apparel and running with evil companions, going to honky-tonks and beer joints and all these kind of places where a saint should not be found. Well, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. What would be easier, my friends, to walk away from a woman tempting us to adultery or the person who says, I can't put my drink down, would it be better to cut your hand off or put your drink down or quit going to the wrong places? Which is harder? It would be easier to overcome. Now, there's one reason from my understanding that the Lord is teaching this, is you know, sin can become a very part of you. It can become so ingrained in a person that it takes extreme measures to get rid of it and pain and sacrifice to crucify the flesh with the affections and lust, but those who belong to Christ have done that according to Galatians 5.24. Another thing is that the Lord is teaching us that it is worth any price to overcome sin and live for the Lord, no matter how much pain it costs us, or even if we have to be tortured to death for the faith. But look at this one more here. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. They're talking about the worm dying not and the fire not being quenched. That's from Isaiah 66, 24. 
the picture of worms feeding on the carcass and continual ruin and decay and never going away, just constant. That's not a pretty picture, is it? That's a symbolization of hell. About 30 years ago in Chattanooga, Tennessee, there was a man, he took this literally. He took a pair of scissors and cut out one of his eyeballs. He really did. But the Lord's not teaching us that we're really literally to cut off the foot or hand or pluck out our eyeball. But He is teaching us that we must be willing to pay any price, no matter how high it is, to get out of sin and follow the Lord faithfully. That hell is just that terrible. It's just that excruciating and painful. As we conclude this evening, I would like to say this because we have gospel preachers here and I love and respect all the men here that preach the gospel and the elders, all of them. And many, of course, have left already, gone back home. But we as preachers need to be reminded, just think about this 10 or 15 years ago, some of the men that have compromised that we know today. We know a lot of them, don't we? 10 or 15 years ago, we wouldn't have thought that of some of these men, would we? What does Paul say to Timothy? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 and 2, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead is appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering doctrine. And he also told Timothy to take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And in so doing, both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4 16. We as preachers have got to take heed to ourselves and to what we preach. We've got to, lest we ourselves become a castaway. And then to the elders in Acts 20, verse 28. Paul said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which you hath purchased with his own blood. Elders, preachers, and all Christians, we must examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. In view of the mirror of the soul, the word of God, James 1, 23-25. To be sure that our life and what we preach and teach is pleasing to Almighty God. But as, well, before we extend the invitation, there's only one thing we have to do to be lost. And that's nothing. That's all. There's nothing. James said to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him and to sin. James 4, 17. This may very well be the most prevalent sin in the church of our Lord. It's failing to do what we know we should be doing. <laughs> How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2, 3. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 9, And do you hear trouble rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. My friends out there, any who may be listening over the internet medium, you don't have to be an adulterer, a thief, a murderer, a drunkard. You don't have to be a fornicator. All you have to do to lose your soul in this terrible place and miss the wonderful home in heaven is not know God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In view of that this evening, if we have any here who need to come and render obedience to the gospel, we must hear and believe the word, Romans 10, 17, believing we must repent or perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, before men. Acts 8, 37, and then arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. And the blood of Christ will cause all of our trespasses to be forgiven. Colossians 2, 13. Having forgiven you all 
trespasses. That's one of the most comforting phrases in all the Bible. Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's how much the Lord loves us. To bathe us in his own blood. If we've done that, but we've slipped from the way. And tonight we know that we need to do, as Peter told Simon of Samaria, to repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps thou thine heart may be forgiven, the Acts 8.22, would you not come while we stand and we sing?